Behind your thoughts and feelings, my brother, there stands a mighty ruler, an unknown sage, whose name is Self. In your body he dwells, he is your body. There is more reason in your body than in your best wisdom, and who knows why your body needs precisely your best wisdom. Nietzsche would establish one of the most expansive and compelling critiques of mind-body dualism to reach Western ears, where writing in the shadows still looming of Schopenhauer, he would challenge the notion that the self is divided between the mind and the body. Nietzsche's view of the self, oddly enough, and whether or not this was intentional, would emerge in large alignment with the scientific view of thought production as demonstrated by neurologists and specialists in the field today. Nietzsche was a pioneer of proto-physio-psychology and the view that the self is the embodied mind. In the process, he would strengthen scientific progression and enhance our collective understanding of how thoughts are produced. But to elaborate upon this view further, let's assess Nietzsche firstly in the negative. The critique Nietzsche launches against Cartesian dualism as Descartes' main project largely goes like this. Descartes was an early proto-psychologist and a philosopher who would write about the intellect as severed from the passions. He developed a skeptical view consistent with the Western notion of soul and ego consciousness, a theological presupposition contained within Christianity that the emotions are earthly and sinful, while reason is otherworldly and divine. The essence here of man to Descartes and the Christians is that of soul and ego consciousness, the brain that governs the body, as though the intellect is some completely detached, neutral and logical vessel operating separately from the material world and the emotional sphere of the human being. This version of the self sees dispassionate logic as an ontologically objective state grounded in the irrefutable existence of God. Descartes' methodology of doubt transmuted a revelation into reason and reinforced the Judeo-Christian tradition that viewed passions and emotion as inherently sinful. This position penetrated deeply into the Western psyche. As Nietzsche emphasizes, the concept of immortal soul invented to throw contempt on the body. Nietzsche's assessment of the conventional understanding of self, as observed within 19th century scholarship and the artistic landscape in his immediate environment, was, in his view, mistaken, too small, and erring dangerously on rigid Socratic rationalism. The latter point, something he prophetically viewed, could only lead Germany down a darkening path, with destruction and violence at the end. Germany, in Nietzsche's mind, lost its way with Dionysus and the creative spontaneity of the individual. Here, love of the state, economy and moral norms superseded individual expression. The jingoistic furor bubbling away was of utmost importance to Nietzsche and without reorienting the dogmatic German psyche towards something pan-European, he feared a tremendous violence. Nietzsche's idea of self and thought production is in opposition to the aforementioned theory of Westernism and what Descartes had laid out and expanded within the tradition of the West. For Nietzsche, cognition and consciousness is the product of a physio-psychological drive, instincts, feelings, actions, sensations and agency that is coursing through the body. And in this sense, our bodies come first, then our minds follow. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we ought to be mistrustful of our own selves, nor are we being deceived by the body. The embodied mind to Nietzsche gives us the closest access to life and to becoming who we are. These bodily drives give us an intrinsic but unique creativity and greatness. More on this subject is linked in this video here about Nietzsche's positive philosophy and his religion of eternity. But Nietzsche's grand project, the revaluation of all values, was designed with first broad cultural implications, and as a result of this, the political implications that would soon follow. Nietzsche's works target the Western sphere and its readers, 
and as such was not intended in itself for German ears alone, though such a goal he definitely played with. And it is difficult to write honestly now of this period in Germany, of course knowing in retrospect the horrors that loomed upon the horizon. In his immediate environment of 19th century Germany, it was only Schopenhauer and several literary and poetry figures, such as Holderlin, Mahler, Goethe, and to an extent though disputed, Wagner, that Nietzsche saw as capable of shaking the increasingly dogmatic German psyche from its trance. Only by the 1890s, as Nietzsche's condition had well and truly deteriorated and he was forced to retire from academic activity, did his work finally enter the zeitgeist and begin being read and taken seriously by the masses. Nietzsche soon became a cultural phenomenon in Germany. It's true that no artist or artistic movement ever surmounted the task Nietzsche set for his readers, nor has a civilization since, or even for that matter ever, actually cleared the path for the overman to walk. However, in spite of the degradation of the social and cultural conditions of Germany and across Europe in the wake of Nietzsche's inactivity, did Expressionism soon emerge, giving visual, literary, architectural, theatrical, and musical style to his philosophy. This movement was not a Nietzschean movement per se, but it echoed the character of many views exclusive to him. Artists of all shades, such as Edvard Munch, Egon Schiel, Otto Müller, Franz Kafka, made their mark as expressionists. These artists impressed a wide range of mediums with their embodied ideas, and in the context of the pre-Second World War Germany, that rejected and isolated itself from the political and social values of its non-allied neighbour states, expressionistic art was able to spread itself thickly upon the German landscape and play a central role in the German zeitgeist. While broad and contested in its definition, Expressionists seek to find form and character in the subjective realm of human experience, where in Nietzschean terms, one loosens the rigidity of Apollonian line and figure to express the deep-seated contradictions of Dionysus. The object is presented to the perceiver as a manifestation of the subjective experience, where the lines between the subjectivity and objectivity are not clearly understood or in the most intense and horrific forms of expressionistic art, the object becomes the subject. There is no demarcation here. The picture as a whole is simply an expression of subjectivity. Expressionism, like Nietzsche, does not accept the world as natural, but instead seeks to challenge the rational, neutral, and unbiased realist forms and world views. And while the German Expressionists sought to convey their subjective experience through a pessimistic and tortured lens, Nietzsche finds distinction to the movement's primary contributors by erecting the philosophy of the triumphant yes against the dark, looming clouds and the turmoil of pessimism. Where we can locate Nietzsche's significance to this movement as a prefiguration is by enabling the creative types to project the inner spirit of themselves upon the external world around them, or metaphorically speaking, within the human body to project the passions upon the intellect. Nietzsche gives style to the inner drives of the human by allowing him to feel his thoughts. He can fall in love with an idea. An idea can make him ill. Nietzsche gives artists and creators alike the grounding for which to express the content of their heart whether Nietzsche designed the methods of his philosophy to be utilized by the nihilistic and life-denying tendencies of the early to middle 20th century German psyche is a dubious line of thinking, though it's certain he sought new forms of expression, detached from the moral paradigms of the day. This is most clearly understood in German Expressionism. <laughs>